stay focused. Don't let them take you off track. Just Hi and welcome to Connecting Football Podcast. Um, we're here with Ryan Gonda again. So just picking up from the the stories that we were on last time. So you've you got your scholar and one you pro at Barnet, and we were linking it back into financial struggles and and f- pressures put on kids and travelling. So do you want to tell us a bit about about the pay and kind of how hard you found it in those first few months? Yeah. Um, well, I think because of Barnet at the time was like cat free. It wasn't really great. Um, but it's a club known for like not really paying players the correct or staff the correct or even on time sometimes. Um, it was bad. I was on, I was on 115 a week as a first year pro. Um, really nothing to you know. If I'm traveling from all the other side away of London, like I'm traveling from like Croydon side to travel all the way up to Northwest, the end of the Jubilee line. It's costing me like like a tenner a day or something like that, and that's that's like fifty sixty pound by the end of the week. But also on top of that, lunch wasn't free at the training ground. You had to pay for lunch at that the training is, ground as, as a pro. As a pro, <laughs> so basically you got your card, you use it, and then at the end of the month, all the times you use it in a month, it will come out at the end of your pay. So like we used to bang it, bang 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 bang, chicken burgers at the training at the training ground. And then um, come to the end of the month, they'll be taking like two hundred or something pound out of your pay because of we used it at the no way. At the training ground. Yeah, it was it was honestly rip off, man. It was a rip off. That's crazy. So, if you looked at kind of how that was, the dream that was set out to you as a fourteen year old becoming a pro, mm. to how the reality was, uh, how did that make you as a? How did you behave? How did you act as a as a person from well, minute one? Well, really. Well, I think without even um without even knowing it like when you're training and that or when you get up in the morning you're like fuck sorry um <laughs> how am i um, gonna get to training today oh gotta bump the train again like it's kind of hard to actually bump the train because they're always there or there's like undercovers or there's like police when you see police there you're like oh, then you gotta go to them and tell them a sob story like look um i've got no money like please could you let me through this time or something like that or you gotta take a fine and give a fake name or just like little things like that. There's always ways around it, but like these are the things as a young boy you shouldn't have to be going through, you know. So professional footballer mm-hmm. bunking the train. Yeah, it's like must make you feel undervalued as well, though, right? Like, how do you like, I, that, that, like, that, like in any walk of life? If you if you pay someone poorly, their motivation is impacted. The quality of their outfit. Yeah, of course. Be, That's what I said. Yeah. Like you wake up in the morning or even after training, you're like I have to buy lunch, but they're gonna take the money, like. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not, mm. like I'm not gonna have no money after this. Like, so that's it's it's it, it was kind of looking back at it, it was hard, but going through it, I had to do it. So I just got on with it. You know, mm. I had to do it. You know, what else could I have done? I couldn't stay at home and just cry myself to sleep. Like, you know, I had to get on this. Did you make a debut, league debut for Barnet? Yeah, when I was seventeen, um, Yeovil away, played Yeovil away. Um, I was actually bricking it. I'll be honest with you, like. I'm not scared of anything that whatever, but when he looked back, you know, when they look back and they give you, yeah, go get warm. You're like, no, yeah. I'm actually going on here. Like, I remember Rossi, uh, Martin Allen said to Rossi at the time, Gaffer was Martin Allen. It was me. And then there was like three, like first teamers. And then Rossi was like, yeah, just put Ryan, put Ryan on there. So he's like, Ryan, go and get you going on. And I was so scared. And then I was, how'd you perform? Um, I think I touched the ball like three times. <laughs> gave <laughs> it away three times. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, but yeah, um, no, it was, it was good, man. I I enjoyed it. Well, I actually enjoyed that bonnet sometimes. But then, what did what? So when you left at the end of the first year, your first year pro, they didn't renew. Did they give you a reason why? They always, every club doesn't actually tell you the real reason why they release you. They just said, look, you're not in our plans, or we're not gonna look, we're not gonna offer you another contract. This and you know, um, good luck in the future and stuff. That's that's all they say. But they don't actually tell you the real reason why, like. For me, they should have said to me, look, like, we love you. We know you're talented, but your problems off, off the pitch followed you in, in, like, you know, we can see the certain way, you're, certain way you're acting. Like, that's what they should really tell young boys. So then, like, you go home and you think about it and you're like, okay, next time I go back, I'll make sure I'm better. So why don't they? Like I said, it's, they, football expects you to be a robot, you know? Eat perfect, speak perfect, act perfect, you know? But it's like, 
all these talented kids, we're not robots, you know. We've got something about us, and that's that's why we're shaped the way we are. You so know, it's easier to have the conversation and just like give the BS of like, oh yeah, you're yeah, you're not in our plans. We we get all the time when we send kids on to, into clubs. Yeah, yeah, he's good, but he's just not better than what we got. How 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 can a young person then go away and do anything or take that away when you that's they think they've got the chance to be inside they go on trial and the feedback is yeah you're good you know better we got how does that that doesn't help what, anyone what's your bare minimum what do you think you should get from a club for on feedback from a Honest, unsuccessful honesty club? yeah and what would you what would be if you were to change the system what would you say is like this is blanket form what are the what are the things you need to hear you, I think it like. The clubs often in the professional world they break it down into t- physical, uh, technical, tactical, social, psychological. The four corner model, right? That's what often used. I think that's probably a very basic way, but that would certainly give some kind of input. Just one bullet yeah. point per square. But I think it's I think it's very different to have to what you what a player what feedback a player gets if they're a trialist, to what a player feedback a player gets if they're released. Mm. Because if they're, they're a trialist, could have been in the building for five sessions in one game so like realistically the detail of the feedback is going to be a certain level but it should still be standardised mm. and it's it should just... be made to be something but a release is, a, is for me a totally different kettle of fish because they've invested what a year or two years with you three years mm. two and a half years two and a half years of investment into you like to then give you we're just not going off you you don't know our plans that's like is it face to face yeah face to face face to face train home train home uh, what was the aftercare like did you speak to the club again did they give you any help PFA no I spoke to um, no 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 in football like I said you get released you get washed to the side that's it like you're, you're not cared for you know whatever that's why a lot of young boys nowadays take their life um, some of them don't even go on to play football anymore because that's what they ever knew mm-hmm. then they get that heartbroken news Um, but for me what I've gone through in my life you know I'm strong so just telling me that just okay cool bye I'll go on and be better and then go on to get another deal and when people mm. talk about like the and this it's interesting angle because what we've spoken about already and what young, what people perceive like disadvantaged young people or challenging young people like boys from inner London is like everything's cut seen as being quite negative mm. but there is a built up resilience level tolerance mm. which is far far higher then in my opinion, what I've experienced with young people that come from more middle class or strong like stronger social families because they haven't had to deal with as much setback or as much uh, as many issues in their life. Like it's, it's what we've been through, you know. You like, can take it more in your stride. That is mm-hmm. like it's, it's it's not normal for like young boys to be exposed to gangs, drugs, stuff like that in London that goes on in London, like. Like the stuff that these boys are exposed to it is crazy mm. like do you know what I'm saying so it's like these boys that, like I said got their daddies there Range Rovers oh dad can I get a can of the goose for a birthday or can I get this and that you know get everything's given to them you know they ain't, they ain't struggled one bit in their life you know whereas like us we gotta go actually go out and get it ourselves you know so that's why like when we get rejected from the club it's like okay yeah see you later I've been through much worse than I've heard worse news than that you know so it's like that's why I think we're a lot more stronger did you think take. You, it was a job at the end of the day you, had, you lost you lost your job and then you go back and find nah, out nah I see that that's, that's the thing Um, I don't see it as a job I've never seen it as a job even though it is a job it's because we're getting paid for doing something we love so essentially it's not a job it's not like you're doing it because of money you're like waking up oh I didn't go to work like for example wake up Oh, I'm going to go work at Tesco, you know, stack shelves. I'm like, I hate this job. I'm just doing it to get money. That's a job. Whereas football, you're going and doing something you love and you're getting paid for it. So that's a bonus. At the end of the day, first of all, you're playing football. That's what you love. On top of that, you're getting paid. Like, what, what more could you ask for? So you wouldn't... You, so your experience of going to Barnet, you, anyone listening to this, you'd say, the opportunity comes, you're always going to take it. Look, you... you at that AJ, you have to take it, you know. You're, you're not in a position to turn it down because of there's many, many boys out there that wish that they're in that position you're in. You have to take it. You know, it's just going through it. It's just not nice, but you have to take it. It's an opportunity you can't turn down. Mm. So now after Barnet, what was the next step? Mm, there was a manager at Barnet, like a player manager called John Nurse. You ever heard of him? 
Mm. Um, exactly. Nursey, mm -hmm. a lovely guy. Mm -hmm. um, he is. He works at Pro Direct Academy now. Mm -hmm. The Met Police one. Yeah, he works at, yeah, he left Barnet and went and coached at Met Police, played there for a bit. Um, he's from like um, South, Southwest, so he understands mm. myself and the players that come through Barnet and what we come from because he can relate. So he um, he helped us out a lot. He was like a mentor to a lot of us. Um, and uh, when I left, he gave me a call and said, look, come down to Met Police, get yourself some game time, play men's football. Because when I was at um, Barnet, I went on loan twice. I went to Hendon with Gary. Mm -hmm. And then the second one was Staines, was Drax. He was a, he was, he was, he was a, um, very understanding as well, Drax. Um, he had sons that was that similar age that played as well um, in Staines while I was there. And... Uh, I enjoyed it. So then I left and then I went and I left Barnet and then I went and played at Met Police like uh, men's football. I was still like, what, 17 at the time, 17, 18. So it's just getting that experience fully in men's football like mm. what it was. But then um remember one time I went to um, Power League while I was at Met Police, got into a fight, punched his boy in the face and his dad was a police officer. And then he his son um, said who I was and then they contacted Met Police. Then I went to Met Police and they said, look, we've got to release you because um, you punched the copper's son in the face. I was like, okay, bye. And then, That's mad. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> Left there, went Kingstonian. Manager called um, Tommy. I think it's Tommy. I think it's Tommy. Yeah now I don't, I don't even like the guy because he's just full of crap lied um, I think I was there for like a couple of months didn't pay me paid me like £50 max like, I was, was like yeah I'm talking to the chairman trying to get you a bit of money like you know it's just always lying 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 I hate the guy even if I see him I hate him then um, also lied to other players as well left there because he was messing around with payment then I went car shooting with Pete. Um, he knows his he knows his football. Pete still he knows his football. When I played car shooting, met out with my best friend Mikel. Mm -hmm. Ricky was there. Yeah, yeah. I had a very very at car shooting. We was good, in that league. Players, we man. was a joke. Mm. Like we was a joke. Like untouchable. Pissed it, and then I left that summer, and then I went to Colchester. Through Morden, yeah. I went on trial at Colchester and then they said, what position are you going to play? And I didn't know what position I was, so I just said 10. There was like, there's four four players in front of you already to go into the first team. So um, you're not going to get a deal at this time, but we got we own Molden, like they owned Molden. It was that like Ryman League. And mm -hmm. it was that, like, um, you go there, do six months. We review it and see if you're ready for Colchester. And I was like, you know, I've just come from car shooting, like, same thing, might as well go play back at Car Shorten. So I've left. Two days later, I got a call from uh, Kevin Horlock. Do you ever know a guy called Kevin Horlock? Yeah, I've heard of him. Nick QPR yeah. and stuff. Uh, he used to be at Man City. Right. He got a move from like Swindon to Man City. Um, he used to be Chatham's old manager, I think. Mm -hmm. Chatham. Anyways, tattoo guy, left foot, like proper, like, like on banter and everything. Oh, lovely guy, man. <laughs> he called me and was like, Gondo, like, come play, man. You'll Honestly, you'll love it. Like, I loved playing under him like actually it was amazing and I went to sign for Molden to be fair because they gave me accommodation up in Essex as well so um, uh, yeah played there he made me captain like first game of the season everything like <laughs> making me captain I was like oh. <laughs> I was like oh. I was it's a bold move yeah though. innit making yeah. me captain and then um, I was 19 I just turned 19 uh, he's playing me left back because he was like, look, the quickest way to get you into Colchester is left back because they ain't got no left backs. You're fast, can defend and that. So yeah, played me left back, scored like 12 goals there. After six months, Colchester reviewed it and gave me a deal. So then, yeah, I'm at Colchester now. And... Better pay? Yeah, 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 yeah. Way yeah. better pay. Looked after you, like accommodation. Proper. Even when I was at Molden, non-league, yeah. gave me accommodation though. Mm -hmm. And I was training with Colchester full-time while I was playing at Molden. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the whole program and system itself was sick mm. because like Colchester are looking at me every, every day while I'm also scoring for Molden on the weekends. Yeah. Mm. So that's why. It's it a good a, model, man. I, like, mm. I don't personally believe that like, 23 football in academy is so sterile. Like it's not, you're not going to cut no. your teeth and be able to go. It's, and it's fake football. It is. It's, 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 it's a nice pictures on everyone's very passive. Like you have the ball, you have the ball. It, like, you're not playing bleeding. for nothing. No, and it's a hold, it's a pen, it's a holding pen for players that aren't obviously not in the first team, but then the best ones in 23 off are going alone anyway. So mm. it's a bit of a, it's a weird, weird system, but the, what Colchester have done, obviously using a non-league club as basically mm. their 23. It's, it's good though, because um, yeah. they send the young boys up to loan for Molden. So the young boy is about to take that step up to first team, get that experience. Exactly. And and you can control the environment because how many times the loans happen, for, like you probably experienced it with, with when you left Barnet or when you're loan for Barnet. It's a weird, like going into non-league from when you're a professional. It's, it's a whole madness. different, different world. Different, it's different it's like Yeah, it's like you train twice a week, then the rest you're doing nothing. Do you yeah. know what it is? I feel like it's, there's like a bubble. Right? When it comes to full-time football, there's like a bubble. Like when you're... Full time football, you're in, you're going to the training ground every morning, is it three or four times a week? You've got yeah. your games, you're kind of rubbing shoulders with those that are meant to be in that full time club or yeah. whatever club you're going to. And that's kind of like a fake environment. Mm. Whereas with non league football, you're going in twice a week, probably in the evenings. You're work, you're playing with somebody who's, who's working in nine to five. Mm. All of a sudden now, it's not, you're not. It's not just a small bubble anymore, but no. that there's outside factors that mm-hmm. can now affect your football. This which is, is going to bring me now. back to the Met Police, your Met Police story. Mm. You would have like you've played football. Do you remember you just come from a bubble yeah. where you're playing full time football, yeah. and you've gone into an altercation and you've punched for you just a random guy because yeah. in your head you're all from the same bubble. You're yeah. playing football together. Mm-hmm. So you didn't think there was going to be anything that was going to come and affect your football. Yeah, you've punched the coppers kid in the face. That's gone and got your opportunity. I met police, which again, it's a non-league club. That's been taken away from you. Yeah. But that had nothing to do with what, what was happening at the club. Yeah. But yeah. because of met police and because of an outside factor now, you're, all of a sudden now it becomes a lot bigger, mm-hmm. becomes a lot broader. And I feel a lot of players struggle with that transition. Mm. So when they do come out of full-time football, um, that fake environment, they're coming into the real world. So then Reality. to get back into it, it's a whole yeah. different ball game. Mm. You see, whole when, when you when you come out the program, like when I just came out, I was in my head, I was thinking, oh, I took it all for granted. Like mm. waking up in the morning, not giving my all in training. I was like, Pfft. I wish I'd done more. Like it's so easy when you're in the system looking out. It's so easy, but when you're out looking in, it's so hard. Mm-hmm. And to get back into the game is so mm. hard. I think that's the hardest thing to get back into the game. Mm. it's so hard it's honestly. rare as well you don't hear stories like you would you have in the system out of the system back in the system almost before the age of 20 yeah, years old yeah no I did and oh, it's not, we're not talking about like being signed at 12 and 13 you were mm. signed at 17 and, yeah. and 19 yeah I was like a late comer I was um, a late comer well, what do you think it is that is the hardest thing stopping you getting back in from non-league to back into the pro game politics that nowadays like it's actually about opinions it's about opinions and like i said it it's robotic they want you to be perfect like no one's perfect you know no one's perfect for me for a manager if you get to know a player you understand why he is that's number one if he suits your style that's number two Everyone deserves an opportunity. I don't feel like a lot of people like myself or a lot of people from the estates now are getting opportunities because we, they're just judging us from where we're from. Mm. You know, they mm. think that, oh. It'd be too much hard work. Yeah, yeah. Don't you know, need the hassle. They don't, yeah, they don't need the, yeah. why, why, why am I going to do the hassle when I can just get a local Tommy Tommy? You know, it's like. I think, the, in my opinion, the, like, the world of football has changed though. Like, if you look at the golden generation when we were young folks like we're showing our age now but the golden generation of English football was was Terry was Beckham was Scholes um, like these guys Teddy Sherry like that was the golden generation and if you look at the golden generation of English football now the the demographic of that player is wildly different we're talking about Sancho Hudson-Odoi Grealish Foden like now, I believe now I've seen in and that's, it's been a, it's been helped connect certainly but I believe now pro clubs are looking at a different demographic. I think they are willing to to look at 
more players from a different um, background, different style, because and it, and I think it's taken too long to get its way down. But I think at mm-hmm. the top, it's now changing, mm-hmm. and I think that's gradually starting to. But it's so slow, and there's so many people, in my opinion, around step one, step two, league two, summer league one, where they don't, they still are, are very skeptical. Of of players of that ilk of your ilk, it's it's, it's, it's like it's like um, like when Eze come to the Prem for Palace, like everyone buzzing off him. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong, he is a he is sick. Like mm-hmm. he is out of this world. There's just many more players like that mm-hmm. in London that goes unheard of. So I don't know why these managers are buzzing off these players now when there's so many of them. They get on the bandwagon. Like, that's that's, that's in the problem. That's what I'm they saying. don't do their research. Like you no, see on social media, research. you see all these, like everyone's like, oh my god, such a sick player. Now all these managers are trying to like, mm-hmm. like come out the woodwork. Like oh yeah. Look at the if you go back to your point, the England under 18s that played this week versus the England under 18s 20 years ago. You wildly do, different. Wildly different. And but you still look at the functions and the setup of that squad this week mm. would still probably have robotic mixed in with those painters and artists they were, they say right the, that mix in with sol- soldiers and artists sorry so you have the battlers and then you have the creative players that give them licence to play mm. no I think that football's become the sport has become more scientific in the last five to ten mm. years I think back to when I did my B licence at 20 the, pro- the coaching process was stop, stand still. What can you do better? Mm-hmm. That's that would never. That's not how we work nowadays because there's an understanding of by doing that I'm singling you out and I'm putting the whole group is aware that you've made a mistake. Mm-hmm. Now certain young people and young people that we work with that, and they see that they that that can kill a kid. That that's it. They can be done with that. Like, so that by that doing can come that. Under bullying. Yeah, and 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 if anything, the that coaching process is only going to make. Um, the players become more robotic because you're highlighting a mistake and telling them what they should have done. Why do I know as a coach what's the right answer? Mm-hmm. When so Ronaldo that... strikes a bought a free kick, ten years ago, fifteen years ago in the coaching syllabus, it'd be that's the wrong technique mm-hmm. because he does it different. But if you can get the knuckle up and down in the back of the net, why? How do you know what the right answer is? Mm-hmm. You don't. Mm-hmm. So the coaching process has changed. The games become far more scientific with analysis with conditioning oh, with physio stats. with it's rehab too, it's too stats. fake the stats yeah. everything's based on it's, stats it's, like, what's, what's that new stat um, about predict, predicted goals or something like that like, what the hell is that the stats but then there is the, the advancements in some regards have helped especially I believe in the coaching process because now the game is meant to be the teacher so there's a lot more freedom mm. there's a lot more learning with, within play and that only highlights players that want to be on the ball, players that want to be creative, players that want to be innovative and off the cuff. Mm-hmm. And I, I do believe that's helping now why these players are coming through. And if you look at every single week, and thankfully we're Kinetic have some uh, coverage in this, but it's all about the South London hotbed, the cage mm-hmm. football. Where, what is cage football? Why are so many players coming through like Arebo and um, like the Glenn Kamara from Rangers? And then obviously we've got this, this up and down the country, there's tons of examples of it. Mm-hmm. So I do believe there is a slight cultural shift, but it's at the top end. And at the moment, in my opinion, it's not getting through to the middle part. And that's realistic where, where you're going to be going back into. As a, as a young aspiring pro, you're going to be looking at League 2, League 1, most probably. It'd be interesting to look at the the stats and, and kind of the careers of those people in charge mm-hmm. of those clubs at middle level, mm-hmm. non-league level. Do those people, are they football purists? Are they 90s footballers that love the non-league kind of style yeah, and like, don't appreciate like, this new style? Like these managers yeah, nowadays yeah. are not um, understanding us because they're old school, mm-hmm. but they've got to realise football's changed. I've heard that phrase a lot. Old school managers in non-league yeah, football. Yeah, like... Why are they still in the job? <laughs> they've got to come out the it's job. It's friendships though, man. I just say it's relationships. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's it's so it's a business and, and, yeah. and it's politics now, but... Football nowadays has changed, man. They got to come out of the game, like. But you're, the reason the players like I'm gonna keep using you as an example, right? Because I think you're a, you're a great example. But I don't believe there is a one size fits all. You don't represent every single young footballer out there. But so mm-hmm. I, I have to be mindful when I'm saying that. But players of your ilk are more challenging to work with. They take more time to understand. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, it's the ego of the of the manager mm-hmm. or the person in charge that is anything of a threat to them. 
is like, no, I'm not having any bit of mm-hmm. it. And so therefore, mm-hmm. it's my way or the highway. And most young players from different backgrounds, they don't want to conform. That's mm-hmm. not, that's, again, that's what they're not. So they therefore you're the only the, your, your type of player is the only one who's going to miss out because that those managers are the ones making the decision at the moment yeah mm-hmm. like and I think that in the years gone by that blocked God knows how many talents from making it through in the game mm-hmm. but thankfully there is a little shift in that and and I'm so glad that that's happening but that block in the middle that old school mentality it's hard to find out how it's going to shift would you say Harry's new school of course no <laughs> <laughs> yeah no of, Shout of, 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 of course but Saying that, it's just, it just goes to show um, how many talents has Connecticut brought through already. How many have gone on and gone signed? Yeah, 46. Europa League? Like, come on, like, that ain't normal. To go and play Europa League from South London. Mm. That's what people dream of. That's literally one step away from Champions League. Yeah. One step away from Champions League. Three like, internationals last week. We're hoping that Reese plays for Wales in the Euros, the Euros yeah. He was playing it with us for only what, two, three. He's only twenty one now. He's twenty two. Yeah. So, like, like who, like Europa League, League One in in France, Bordeaux. Like this is playing against PSG. This ain't normal. Do you know what I think the like, issue is though, bro? This is not normal. It's bro, like what H has done, like um, with Fives and Connect is it's unbelievable. I think the problem is, um, especially in non-league, is that they're they command and demand respect mm-hmm. for what for whatever journey they've been through. Yeah. And that's the biggest issue. Like to be respected, you gotta give out that respect. Mm. So as a player, I could come into any footballing environment and you, as a man as a, as my manager, I'll I'll already give you a certain amount of respect because obviously you've gone through what you've been through. You kind of done your badges or whatever. You've got yourself in the position you're in now to run run the club. But what the problem is is that they enforce that position and that power on players, and then they will take it out by by docking their wages or by withholding them withholding their money. Mm. And it's like when you try to force that type of power onto a player, especially where we're from, where like we're fight we're fight or flight. Mm. So like we're so used to being so um, oppressed and suppressed. Like anytime there's any sort of kind of power trip or dominance that people try to put onto us, we automatically we're going to fight it. Yeah. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? And the, the, for me, that's why I said like, when I started playing with MH, it was completely different in terms of like, never had to raise his voice ever. Mm. That's what, that was one thing. Like for me, my, my parents are shouting at me. Mm. So there's no way that another person, regardless of who you are at a football club can shout at me and I'll take it on the chin. Mm. It just doesn't make any sense to me. But it's it's more than just it's just even as we said like the old school and new school mentality is like pre season like I mentioned in a um, um previously it's like I went there and there was footballs everywhere mm. and it was just for me it was a breath of fresh air yeah. like we did our running but again it, he put the he put everything onto you as a player like if you want to end up being unfit that's down to you you just won't play but I shouldn't have to force you to run yeah. and to be fit do you know but what I'm their saying their pre season is good because of um. You get the fitness out of like disguised running. Exactly. You know? mm-hmm. It's not just bring your runners 20, you 25 there, there, there. Yeah, what are yeah, you going to yeah. get out of that? It's not football you know? related. No, of course it's not. So that's why I feel like what they're doing now is something new and, and it it needs needs more of it, you know? Mm-hmm. 100%. Need more of this in clubs, you know? But um, st- I, I'll still be blocked. People will still regard me as a as a manager that doesn't have the right relevant experience or, or hasn't done X or Y in the game. Or, yeah, or young or, mm-hmm. um, and I don't feel young anymore, flipping out. Um, <laughs> but like young or like, yeah, naive. Mm-hmm. Like, does he have control? Can you manage a big budget? What? Why? Because I can manage a small budget. Why can't, that's harder than managing a bigger budget, surely. Proofs in the pudding as well, the amount of talent that you've brought through um, and they've gone on to be pros. Whereas if these young boys didn't come to you and went on trial at these, at these clubs, would they have gone on to have the careers they had now? No. Why not? Because they're not robotic. Mm. You know, it's about understanding a player and getting the best out of him, like we said. That's what it takes. We've always said that actually the kids on in the programme, 16 to 18, 19 year olds, on their way up, mm. often become a lot more driven and, and 
they have that desire to get in maybe on their first uh, like taste of academy football than those potentially released on their way down. The, the releases that come out are the hardest to turn and actually it takes a special character to be able to say, actually, I've been released, I need to get back in there mm. and actually how do we change their mindsets? What do the clubs do to help them? Mm. Um, it comes back to the robots. The robots, it's is, is so obvious why they've become these robots because there's such an emphasis on the whole 10,000 hours thing, like the whole, which is based on, fl on flipping a violinist in like, God knows where, like Prague. Mm -hmm. that if you do 10,000 hours of elite training, then you'll become an elite performer. Mm -hmm. We tried to do that for football. And all we did was did unopposed, rep like repetitive technical exercises with these players. And we created robots. Football is not a robotic sport. It is, mm -hmm. there's so many variables. And the whole coach process before of stop, stand, still, what could you do better I, this time next time do this you're never going to freeze the picture again in football and it will look the same mm -hmm. so we need to teach players to be think creatively and collaboratively and mm -hmm. innovatively within the the moment of the game and and that's what I think why like the cage football is becoming so prominent because there's never a right answer there's never mm -hmm. a, the same situation mm -hmm. if you want to take a player on like in a in a 5v in a 3v3 you want to take three players on that will happen time and time again in cage football. They'll yeah. go past three players and score. But if yeah. they were in the academy, if it's not 1v1, recycle possession yeah. will go again. Yeah. And you and it just recreates these robots. But mm -hmm. actually, there's a there's a there's an opportunity there, which I think a connect we've capitalized on because when those under 18 sides of the academies, they've got their robotic players, they've got their ones there, and then suddenly you throw a Jaribo in the mix, it's different, it's new, mm -hmm. it's off the cuff, mm -hmm. it's unconventional, and it catches the eye. And there's so many examples that like Lookman going in there from, from Waterloo into into mm -hmm. Charlton, Charlton, blowing up. Oh, um, Aribo blowing up. Mm. We put CJ into Derby. He trained with the first team in two weeks because he's so different to what they've got. Quadro Bar. Quadro is a, a phenomenal talent who's, who's making making big waves in the game. And Quad's, a, what, 12, 40 months ago was, was playing for us. Josh Marja, Sunderland. There, there's mm. so many he examples. He owned that documentary. Isn't there? <laughs> he yeah. owned it. But he was, he was, that's an example of how he poor, he was so poorly perceived in that documentary yeah. that yeah. was so unfair. Yeah, like, that's because, of, because of the politics side of things, the business yeah. side. And because it made for better viewing. <laughs> but it wasn't yeah. true. It, and yeah. it, made, it, it made him out. And how... How Josh had the strength of character to not respond in the media, to mm -hmm. not come out on socials and start slagging this X, Y, and Z off. He just got his head down and cracked on. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible it's strength of character. It's been two years of that, he's in the Prem. Back in the Prem, yeah. But an incredible strength of character because he must have been fuming I, I, with how young boy like that having cameras in your face and, you, know. and, and you go on to the internet and you search your name up and mm -hmm. you get death threats all, from yeah, fans. All that, and that's the thing nowadays, social media is... is killing people off the pitch you know all you got to do is search a name and boom everything comes up people just absolutely no, like the the whole racism in, in and how that's happening in the sport is disgusting like mm. the, the, the fact that socials aren't protecting players of, of it's not even players it's, it's protecting people mm. from, from abuse from people from keyboard warriors is unbelievable but how, how I don't know how I deal with that have you ever googled your name search your name on Twitter if like back in the day you said you, you've uh, yeah, I searched, searched my name in Google. Like, like, but is it I've like got for, Wikipedia now, and I'm back. You know, that, that's not. But that's the thing, like, negativity. Where I'm from, all this stuff is is not normal. But no, I've never um searched my name in for for negativity. Okay, but that's the thing with me. Whatever people say about me, I don't care. Yeah. Like, Do you though? It must get to you. No, it doesn't get to me. Honestly, that like, that's not me just saying that because I'm trying to do acting. But no, it honestly don't get to me. Like. You don't know what sort of thing I am. When people say something about me, mm. I always say to them, I always, <laughs> I always say, I always have the last laugh. Mm. And I do. The thing is with me, if you say something to piss me off, you're going to piss me off in the wrong way. It's just going to rebound on you. That's the thing I do. I just... Um, it's again, that shows a lot of resilience. Most people aren't made up like yeah, that. Take it the wrong like way, how many yeah. times a season? Yeah, that's what I'm laughing. Like, this, no banner. <laughs> this time it's, we've been losing one nil or losing or nil nil, whatever. And people on the other team are always on my face, like, like blah blah. I'm like, okay, watch now. The game just goes boom, and I go score a hat trick or something. What, like, what not? What brought you back to work with Harry? Mm. You know, I still remember where I was at that call. It was on before your premiere. Oh really? Was it that day? Yeah, that exact day. <laughs> yeah. So basically, okay. <laughs> uh, that season, I had a really bad, I had a season. So that season, I got released from Colchester, and 
What did I do? I, um, I left coaches. I can't even remember. Concord? Yeah, I, I, I went up to Scotland. I was in Scotland um, at Hamilton. My boy, Mikhail, was at Hamilton. He brought me up there um, and I was going to play a match, but I couldn't get the registration in time. And then they were, they were going into international duty. So I was like, oh, I was like, F all this, man. So I'll come back down to London, went to for Concord, first game, got injured, pulled my hamstring out for six weeks, come back fit, wasn't playing me. So I was like, F this, man. Um, about to go to Crimford Casuals, but then Hamilton, like, because mm-hmm. Hamilton used to be at Crimford Casuals, put me on with, I knew James Bracken though from when I was at Sutton, the manager at Crimford. And then Hamilton was like, come to Whiteleaf. I was like, who's the manager? Harry. I was like, what? That's that. Like, no brainer, cool, called Harry and I was like, Harry, like, like come on, sort me out, man. Like, I'm not playing, I'll come and play. Buzzing, he's like, Yeah, come play Saturday, you'll start. Boom. So I come Saturday, remember we played Whitehawk, yeah. like big team in the league, smashed them what like five two? Some four yeah, two, four, I think two, it was. Yeah, yeah four two. We were in a rut as well, we yeah, weren't in good forms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um I don't think we touched the ball for the first five minutes and you got it once, run past three. Yeah, run past played play, the play, Corey play, goal. Scored, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, then ever since then, um, Played for Harry. So Harry's saying actually that you turned around his career because he was in a rut. You oh. scored. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I would have got the coming yeah, yeah. yeah. Um Outside of his podcast, in there, he said how much he helped me. I, I've sorted him. I've sorted him right out. <laughs> no, um, no. I think for both parties, for myself, game time, and just getting that confidence back and enjoying football because I wasn't enjoying it was a major part for me and also for me to come in and help the club was also good. So yeah, man. Um, and you're not the only one that have said actually come in and play with, with Harry yeah. as a, a player that's maybe dropped down a level or something yeah. and then stuck around. Yeah, so um, I was, what, when I came, um, 22. Mm. Yeah, 22. Um, I'm 23 now, so a year on I've been there. So last year when lockdown first started was when I joined. And um, uh, the money at Whiteleaf is not good at all, but I haven't come for that. And players don't come to Whiteleaf for that because if you're playing for money, that Whiteleaf is the last place you'll look. <laughs> Um, now honestly like this is oh, we're talking, real, we're talking real life here, you know, we're talking yeah. so everyone can hear this um, the money's not great at all at Whiteleaf and everyone knows that but he the club attracts good players because of the manager the coach Callum uh, what they got going on there it is a professional environment okay cool we ain't got the facilities and the money but it's a professional coaching environment you know you get you get something out of training sessions you're coached properly um you get taught how to play football properly the way it should be played in this day and age how football should be played that's what you get at Whiteleaf you know you've got good players down there as well so um it gets you ready for even if a pro club comes in like you ain't been missing out on anything because of the way they do things you've seen enough rubbish in the past yeah actually you don't want to waste any more time on that you want to make sure that you spend your time yeah so I feel like where I'm at right now at Whiteleaf with Harry is the perfect way to get me ready to go back into even off the pitch. Like he helps out massive off the pitch. Mm-hmm. Like he's basically my dad off the pitch about a no. Mm. So it, it it's massive what, what's going on at Whiteleaf. And like it's sad that I have to say Whiteleaf because that's the club we're at when we I should say Harry FC. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, 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 honestly, like that's the thing. That's what attracts everyone to Harry. You know? Um so when people are there questioning why 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 is everyone going down to Wiley for what is it down there isn't it like it's Harry what's the magic formula at Kinetic it's Harry it's respect though man it's just like they respect every like it doesn't matter how old you are you could be 15 they respect you from where like your background they respect where you come from they respect your goals and they will help you achieve that goal doesn't matter how old you are and that's one thing that is very very vital when it comes to working with any type of person in football is that having that respect for each other. Mm-hmm. Once you have that, then literally the sky's the limit. And like, I can tell you for free, like in non-league, there's, I don't think there's any player that can say anything bad about Harry. No. Just in the way he uh, he deals with certain things. I remember, I, I don't really want to bring it up, but it's annoying, but I have to. Remember that time when we um, was on the FA Cup run mm. and was about to play St. Albans, was it? Yeah. Um, to get into the first round proper. Yeah. We got kicked out of that tournament. I mean, out of the FA Cup because he tried to help a player out. That wasn't helping him. <laughs> out. Like because he wasn't he wasn't going to get in the side. That the side was really good that year. He wasn't really getting. Like H was like, listen, okay, let me try and help you out. So he's called certain managers here, certain managers there to try and get him a club to play football. Which 
most most managers wouldn't do. Mm. And it's not his responsibility. If you're not good, like the way they the way they deal with things, if you're not good enough for what I'm trying to do, you got to go elsewhere. Yeah. But he's gone and stretched his neck out and we all paid the price for it, including mm. himself. And do you know what I'm saying? Like, there's not many people like that. And we all acknowledge that and respect that. Mm. Well, That's why you'll get players like that. That sets up us up perfectly for the next episode. And we'll talk mm. about the coaching and how things get brought together at Kinetic, at Non-League and everything else. So mm-hmm. thanks for your time again, guys. We'll speak about that on the next episode.